Okay, so good morning, everyone. Nice to see you here. Uh, so my name is Frederik Heinz. I'm a professor of computer science at Linköping University, uh, where I do research on AI and autonomous systems. I've been doing for a little bit more than 20 years now. So we actually had fully autonomous helicopters about 20 years ago. Uh, when I was a PhD student, so then we actually built uh, fully autonomous helicopters, integrating a wide range of different AI technology into working fielded systems. And actually, we tried it here in the vicinity outside Lund in Reavinge. Uh, there is like a rescue school uh, where we could try the things together with firefighters and, and these kind of things. So uh, using the technology in fielded applications together with first responders. Uh, today, I, I lead a research group called the Reasoning and Learning Group, so where we do um, uh, research in the kind of intersection or combination of machine learning and machine reasoning, uh, combining these different kind of approaches. But I also work quite a lot on the European Union level, uh, where I have been a member of the European High-Level Expert Group, where we have developed the ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI. And uh, I, now I'm also involved in writing the strategic research, innovation and deployments agendas uh, for the European Ed Partnership on AI Data and Robotics, which I presented in Paris uh, yesterday. Uh, so today I wanted to kind of give an overview uh, of some of the activities that we have been doing in this area of uh, trustworthy AI. So in, I want to talk about what is happening on the EU level, because if you are developers working on uh, tools and applications using AI and machine learning, you will most likely be affected by this regulation that is coming. Uh, I also have some research projects that we are involved with that I wanted to uh, mention in case you want to learn more. I should say this will not be kind of a technical talk, but I'm more than happy to take any type of questions uh, afterwards. So uh, let's get started. And um, okay, did not work this time. Um, what is this? Ah, okay, something else. Ah, now it works. Yes. So, of course, I mean, AI, everyone is talking about it. I think it's interesting because uh, as an AI researcher, I mean, Linköping University has been doing AI research since the 70s. So we have been doing this for more than 50 years. Uh, but it's interesting also when it uh, hits the broader, uh, what say, public, public uh, population and where we see this broad adaption in society. So I would say that today, um, most people use AI act probably on a more or less daily basis, you use it for recommendations for books, videos, uh, and so on. You use it to uh, translate between different languages, you use it for voice recognition, and a bunch of other things. But at the same time, even though we have come quite far, there's still a very rapid development in this area. And I'm absolutely certain that AI will uh, influence all aspects of society. And the reason is that AI is what we call a general purpose technology. So it's a technology which uh, changes the way other technologies uh, work and what they can do. So it really changes uh, both uh, technology itself, but also society broadly, which is actually a challenge because it's much harder to deal with these horizontal questions than kind of vertical, uh, more technical specific questions. Uh, I strongly believe that AI should be both uh, human-centered and trustworthy. So, so I'm very much in favor of the European approach to, to AI, where we in Europe say that, yes, we want AI, but we don't want any AI. But rather, we want AI that we can trust and that is human-centered. And with human-centered, we mean that uh, the purpose is not the technology itself, but rather the positive effects that this technology has. So it's, the, it's a means towards making life better for us. And uh, with trustworthy, we mean that we should be able to trust on this technology, that it doesn't uh, do us harm. Uh, I think that two things that are really different uh, today compared to, to uh, a lot of previous approaches is the scale and the speed with which things happen. And I think it's quite interesting where we see, for example, this, say, the deep learning uh, uh, techniques, where you see that scaling these up suddenly or yeah, get these huge differences. So just by scaling up, you get systems that are significantly better. It's not a linear change. You make it twice as large, you get twice as good, but rather you make it 10 times as large and it gets 100 times better or 1,000 times better. So it's really non-linear when it comes to scaling. 
Uh, and I think this is another aspect of scaling is that you need these kind of large infrastructures. You need a lot of data, you need a lot of compute in order to have a chance to do this, which of course is a challenge if you're a smaller uh, company or a smaller country like, like Sweden. Uh, and the same with speed, that things are happening very fast. Previously, you might say, oh, what has happened the last year? Then it was what happened last month. Then it was what happens last week. And now it's more like what's happened last 24 hours uh, in this area. And uh, I think it's quite uh, Im impressive how much development and how much progress is being, being made very, very rapidly. But this, of course, is also a challenge if either you're like a university where I work, where you're trying to, to keep up, or if you're a regulator trying to keep up and so on. But of course, that's challenges that we uh, like uh, addressing. And when it comes to actually using this, I think that two things is really important. Infrastructure. I mean, if you want to do these large-scale systems, you really need large-scale infrastructure. Uh, so, so that's usually a, a challenge for, for some, uh, but you also need leadership. <clears throat> so, I mean, <clears throat> this is more a, a developers conference. Uh, if I talk more to the senior management, uh, then I'm trying to convince them that just let your developers do what they're good at, and then things will go well for you. Uh, so, but you usually need the leadership support to be able to do that, and that uh, we as a company want to do this, we as a company uh, prioritize this, so giving the mandate to the developers and others to actually do their job. And finally, uh, I don't believe in this kind of existential risks and that AI will uh, extinct humanity or things like that. I'm not particularly worried about that. However, what I do believe in is that those people and those organizations that effectively use this technology will have a major advantage over those that do not which means that we do risk, run the risk of uh, people and organizations that effectively use AI will outcompete those that do not. So, so I don't think it's uh, potentially very wise to just sit still and wait and see what happens, but I really believe that this is something we need to, to adapt and to uh, leverage. Uh, so uh, if you go back to this, AI is developing fast. Uh, as I said, I've been, been around for a while. Uh, I'm even so old that I've been using these prompts and I started programming on Commodore 64, so now you can guess my age. Um, but anyway, um, I think it's interesting to see this kind of development uh, over the, the years. I mean, it started out with self-driving cars around 2015 or so. I mean, whereas huge uh, talk about self-driving cars. <clears throat> and then actually the claim was that around now, 2025, we would have the self-driving cars everywhere. Uh, you might have heard that Cruz lost their license uh, a few days or was it last week or something like that uh, ago. And uh, so we see that major developers are no longer allowed. But at the same time, I heard that 500,000 people in the US drive or are being driven, maybe I should say, uh, autonomously every day to, to work. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, my expectation here is that, yes, it will take longer. Yes, it is a harder problem than we that people maybe believed, but I do believe we will get it sooner or later. Then it was all these uh, uh, computer games where uh, the computer was beating the human world champions. Uh, of course, this started, I think, already in 1958 or something like with checkers. Uh, but, uh, and then it was chess in 2000, oh, sorry, 1997, uh, Jeopardy 2007, 2009, uh, and then uh, Go uh, 2016. And I think it's quite interesting that basically if you have a relatively well-defined uh, um, uh, environment and, and problem such as games, then it's more a question of time before the computer will be better at this than us. And of course, this also includes poker and bridge, these kind of um, games where you don't have perfect information and where you have the kind of social interaction as part of the, the games. It doesn't really matter, it still beats us. And then, of course, the, the last year and a half or so, the focus has been very much on this generative AI, where you have AI models generating new content, uh, such as these pictures of the, the teddy bears. So you basically have a prompt, something like two teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals dressed up as cyberpunks. And from this short prompt, you're able to generate photorealistic images that captures our imagination. And I think it's quite interesting if you're a computer scientist like me, it's like, you know, compression, you want to compress as much information into as little information as possible. And this is the complete opposite. You have extremely minimal amount of information. What was it, 10, 15 words? <clears throat> and from these 10, 15 words, you're going to generate a couple of megabytes of image data, which has to be very, very specific, very, very detailed in order to be believable. So, so it's really the opposite of uh, compression. 
so, so I really think this is quite interesting. And of course, today there is a lot of talk about these large language models uh, where the, the uh, computer is now able to do a, a wide variety of things uh, related to, to language. Uh, so handwritten recogni handwriting recognition, I mean, this has been done since the mid 80s, but uh, now it's really uh, working very well. Speech recognition, same, also been working for a long time. Image recognition, that was basically what started the deep uh, learning revolution with the 2012 uh, paper on AlexNet, uh, beating the ImageNet uh, uh, benchmark uh, dramatically. And now it's the yeah, reading comprehension language understanding. I don't really like the word understanding, but at least it's very impressive what these large language models can do with uh, generating, summarizing, organizing, synthesizing, and so on when it comes to natural language. And I do think this is really, really significant because basically all of our society is built using language. And of course, it's not only natural language for people, but also computer code and so on. That's also language. So I'm sure you've all maybe already tried uh, using these models to actually generate code. It also works perfectly well for that. Well, I shouldn't say perfectly well, of course, but at least it's, it's uh, useful uh, for that. And uh, the common theme here is that the development is very fast and we have seen this rapid progress. And of course, the question is what comes next? And we'll see about that. Uh, but I also think it's nice to go back to these games. Uh, so chess is one of these games where we as humans don't have a chance against the computer. As I said, it was since 1997 when Garry Kasparov lost against IBM Deep Blue. Uh, so it's very clear that the computer is significantly better than we are. But at the same time, we can see that the interest for chess has never been higher. And that the quality of human chess playing has never been higher. And why? Well, because we are playing against the computer. We're training to become better by playing against the computer. I've even heard it said that the reason that Magnus Carlsen is one of the best chess players in the world is because he is the person that's the best to play like a computer, and therefore he's the best human. As now that's our benchmark. We have to become more like the computer. Uh, so, so I think that's interesting. But what's also interesting is that if you combine humans and chess playing uh, programs, they're actually better than the best humans and the best chess playing pro programs on their own. And actually this was an experiment done by Gary Kasparov himself. So after being really unhappy and very unpleased with, with losing against uh, IBM Deep Blue, he realized that, well, I guess I will not have a chance. So then he was part of founding a company that is developing these chess playing programs and probably made millions, if not billions on that. Uh, and then he also organized these contests uh, where humans were playing together with the programs. Uh, and then they were outcompeting uh, both the best humans and the best machines. So I really think that the lesson learned here is that it's not a question of either AI or humans, but it's really a question of AI and humans together. At the same time, we have to realize that it's a different skill to play chess with a machine compared to playing chess on your own which means that it wasn't the kind of grandmasters that was winning this, but rather people that were good at chess, but knew how to use this tool to effectively play the game. So basically you had to uh, select different strategies and then they, they were seeing, comparing these different strategies and then choosing which uh, move to actually make. So that the, the computer was doing the tactical uh, kind of, when you have decided what to do, I mean, what goal to reach, it computed optimal choice for that, but to choose which goal or which strategy to play, their humans were better. So we have to work with competence development. It's, just, it's not only take the best possible tool, take the best possible expert and put them together. That's not necessarily going to make any improvement. So we really have to work with competence development. We also have to work with uh, uh, business development and uh, developing the actual ways of working and the processes and so on, so that they are adapted to take advantage of these tools. Otherwise, there will not be much value. So I really think this, this is important, uh, both competence development and developing the business. Uh, and to just show I mean, that it seems to actually be true also for other applications. So this was an experiment that was done, I think, in, in the spring, uh, where they uh, gave um, customer support service people uh, access to, to ChatGPT. Uh, and then it turned out if you were using this tool from day one, you very rapidly became better 
uh, or like, more, more productive than those that have been working there for, for almost a year. So that's the blue curve, that's the top curve. So you see, very rapidly got very effective. Uh, um, but what's interesting was also that they took people that had been working uh, in this job for five to six months, they gave them ChatGPT as a tool, and uh, that's the gray line in the middle. So you see that they became slightly better, but not significantly better. And my, my hypothesis here is that this is because if you learn to do the work with the tool, then you learn to do it with the tools. I mean, that's your normal way of working. But if you first learn to do it manually, and then get the tool, maybe some of the things you, you did manually, you can now uh, automate or get support for, but mostly you work more or less as before. So I really think this shows that there's a difference if you learn to do the task with the tool compared to you, you introduce the tool later on. Um, so I think that's interesting for the future. And then this study also came uh, relatively recently, uh, <clears throat> where they did a study on 700 consultants at the BCG, uh, when they were studying how these consultants uh, were working across a large number of different types uh, of uh, activities. And they came to the conclusion that they, they both became more, uh, they, they finished more tasks, so they could do more things, 12% more things. They did everything quicker, so 25% faster than before. And most importantly, they did it with higher quality than before. So 40% higher quality than before. So it's both faster and better. Uh, and I really think this just shows the potential impact of this technology on uh, uh, the future work. So my expectation is that this will be an integrated part of most working environments. And that's why I also really believe in this, that those people and those organizations that effectively use this technology will have a major advantage. So, um, but of course, there are also challenges. And I mean, we do see that there is concerns about these uh, applications and so on. So, of course, we want to reap the benefits, but we also want to minimize the risks. Uh, and that was the, the reason that the European Commission uh, started their uh, AI strategy, I think it was 2016. And one of the things that it did was to uh, form this uh, European high-level expert group on AI, where I was one of 52, I think it was, uh, experts from, from different fields. Uh, and we were tasked with developing these ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI. Uh, and we then defined trustworthy AI as uh, having three major properties. The first is that you need to be lawful. That means you have to follow the applicable rules and regulations, which of course sounds perfectly obvious, but there are very interesting cases such as if you take the self-driving cars, uh, should a self-driving car uh, violate the traffic rule in order to reduce the risk for an accident? And I think that is situations that probably, unfortunately, we also encounter from time to time. Uh, and, uh, and, but now the interesting question, if you are a manufacturer of these, what will you build your systems to do? And I, and I probably find, probably it will be very hard for a company to argue, well, we broke the, the rule, there was no accident, but we, we thought it might be a chance that it was an accident, so therefore we, we, we did this. I think that will be a very hard sell. Uh, so probably it will be more likely that they will prefer the accident over violating the, the laws. And that may, may or may not be what we want. Um, then they should also satisfy four ethical principles uh, that I have on my, my next slide here. Uh, and the, the third part, uh, which I think is actually very significant, is that you also have to have a robust and safe implementation, meaning that good intentions is not enough. You actually have to build good systems. Uh, and I really think this is a key uh, component because, of course, it's very easy to say that you satisfy all these nice properties, but actually doing it for real is a different thing. And continuing on that theme, they, again, it's very easy to state these general principles, but it's really, really hard to operationalize them. How do we actually realize them in implemented systems? Uh, 
So uh, we took a number of steps. So from these principles, we defined seven requirements. And from these seven requirements, we also developed a, an assessment list. So basically questions that you can ask yourself within your organization to try to uh, see have we done uh, what we can towards realizing these requirements. So we started the process already back then. I think this was published in 2019. So it's been a while. Uh, so the four ethical principles that we uh, defined, that we set forth, uh, was all based on fundamental human rights. And the first one is that one should respect human autonomy, meaning that these systems should uh, augment, complement, and empower humans and people uh, so that these tools should not replace, but rather uh, empower us to do things that we want to do. It also means that we should still be able to decide over our own decisions, uh, which means that even when we make bad decisions, we should still be allowed to make our bad decisions. Maybe because we, we like doing that. Uh, and I think, again, here there are interesting kind of gray zones, for example, nudging. So you might have an app uh, where you have uh, to make you eat healthier or to make you exercise more or something like that. And since you installed it, you configure it, you choose whether you want to use it, then probably no, no big deal. But now imagine that your insurance company says that, oh, if you install this app, if you start eating healthier, if you start exercising more, we will reduce your pre premium with 20%. Then it becomes a little bit more questionable. Is this reasonable? Is this fair? Uh, and then you can take even the third step, say, oh, now we want to improve the health of our population. So the government says that everyone should start using these apps so that we get a more healthy population that exercise more. Then it's not as clear anymore uh, whether this is in our interest. Is it violating our autonomy? We'll see. Uh, the second one is prevention of harm. I think this is probably the most easy category in some sense, unless, of course, you've read all Isaac Asimov's novels, because that's very much around this. But I think just to take one interesting case about how to deal with this is, again, taking our self-driving car. Should you prevent the harm of the people inside the car, or should you prevent the harm of the people outside the car? If you end up in a situation where you cannot do both, which, of course, everyone would like to try to do. And again, if you're a car manufacturer, do you want to say, oh, our car will save the people outside, and, but you that bought the car or rent the car, will, you will be second choice. I think that will be a very hard sell. Um, and then the third part uh, is fairness. So of course we want these systems to be fair, meaning both when it comes to distribution of benefits, but also the distribution of costs. But again, this is something that's notoriously hard to define in a bit more quantitative terms. And you can just take again, just touching the surface and say, do we want fair outcomes, meaning that everyone should have roughly the same outcome, or should everyone have roughly the same amount of resources? So it should be fair distribution of resources, or should be fair distribution of outcomes? Because of course, if we have fair distribution of resources, which some says everyone gets equal uh, resources, then we will be e very differently in how we use these resources, which means that we will have very different outcomes. And the other way around, if we want to have roughly the same outcome, then we need to distribute the resources <coughs> unevenly so that everyone roughly reaches the same place. So, and of course, this is just the top of the iceberg, so there's a lot of other challenging things. And actually, if you're talking about machine learning, so I mean, this is one major area. I mean, how do we reduce the bias? How do we make our machine learning methods or at least the models that we train more fair and less biased? Uh, and and uh, there was um, Sandra Wachter in, uh, in Oxford, I believe she is. Uh, she did a study basically looking at all the um, cost functions or loss functions and so on that people use uh, to guide the machine learning. And I think she came to the conclusion none of them satisfied this criteria according to the European regulation. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And I think she also proposed some, some new ones. And of course, that was a few years ago, so there have probably been several new developed since then. But I mean, this, these are not easy questions. Uh, and the fourth one is about explicability, meaning that we want to have some understanding of how these systems work, on whose behalf they're working, and how can, uh, I mean, trust in these outcomes. So explainability, I don't like the word explainability, but uh, uh, 
you get to understand it. We, we want to have an understanding of how to interpret the output of these systems. And that's all related to this explicability. So these are then the principles. And now there is uh, work on developing what's called uh, the AI Act, uh, which is then a regulation based on these uh, guidelines, I would say. And um, what, what they're doing here is they're taking what they say call a risk-based approach, meaning that depending on the risk associated with application, uh, the amount of regulation that applies is, is comparable. Meaning that if you have uh, certain applications are, may have so high risk that we don't even want them, so they should be banned. And the examples that have been used here is um, social scoring. Of course, everyone is uh, talking about China, but not mentioning China, saying basically, oh, this is the kind of system we do not want. Uh, it's also subliminal manipulation, uh, that we are uh, making people do things that they otherwise wouldn't want to do uh, without them knowing it. And the third, which I think is probably the most debated, and that's remote biometrical identification, which of course you can translate into uh, face, face, facial recognition uh, in, say, public places. Uh, I think now they're limited to uh, facial recognition in real time in public places, uh, something like that. But uh, So this is, of course, uh, debated. So, of course, the police and law enforcement and so on want to have this possibility, and uh, other people are not as interested. So, so these would then be banned. Uh, but then the most interesting category is the high-risk category. Uh, and this would be things that have a major impact on people's lives and well-being. So it could be things related to medical applications, probably education activities, HR-related uh, applications, and so on and so forth. Uh, and these would then have quite significant regulation on what you need to satisfy before you put this product on the market. So I would say the way to interpret this legislation is as a product uh, regulation. It basically regulates what you as developers, what you as providers uh, of these uh, services need to satisfy before you can introduce it to the European market. Uh, and then this is really about the European market then. Uh, and then the expectation is that the vast majority of the applications <coughs> will be considered minimal or low risk, meaning that there should be very limited uh, regulation related to them. Personally, I think the, that that's to me is the highest risk with this particular approach is that I think most or a large chunk <coughs> of the applications will end up in a high risk category. But I guess that will remains to be seen. And if you're uh, counted as a high-risk application, then we come into these details where they're basically following these seven uh, requirements that, that we defined. Uh, but you have to use high-quality training, validation, and testing data. I can say in the first draft, it said that the training data had to be complete and without error. And if you ever worked with these systems, you know that that, of course, is impossible. Uh, so at least they've, they've uh, loosened up the language a bit. Uh, but you also need to have uh, logging capabilities so that if a problem is detected later on, you should be able to go back and re uh, discover what caused this and how did this occur. Um, and you also have to have human oversight of these systems and you have to take uh, steps towards robustness, accuracy and uh, cybersecurity. So there will be a significant amount of things related to that. Uh, and one interesting aspect is also that much uh, of the details of this regulation will not be in the law itself, but rather it will be delegated to standards. So currently there is a significant effort in developing the standards which will then actually be the things that uh, companies need to uh, follow in order to uh, live up to this regulation. So you can see there is a long list of the different articles uh, in the Act and the corresponding uh, uh, standardization committee for that and some of the other existing standards uh, related to this. So if you want to influence and if you want to be part of developing this, this is the time to engage because this is happening now. In a year or two from now, things will basically be settled. So uh, you can imagine the consequences of that.
so the, the state of this regulation is that uh, it's currently in what's called the trilogue. So the European Commission came with its proposal uh, a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, the Parliament came with their counter proposal right before, or right, yeah. In, in the summer uh, as part of the Swedish presidency. And then after that, the trilogue starts where you have negotiations on how to merge these two uh, proposals uh, between the commission, the parliament and the member states. And that's where we currently are. Uh, and uh, you may know that there is an election to the European uh, parliament next year, meaning that they basically need to finish this this year because then there will be election period and then nothing happens until the new uh, parliament is in place. So they basically have uh, two months or one and a half months to finish this. So it would be interesting to see. My personal expectation is that they will do it because they have no choice. They have to just finish it because the alternative will be worse. So I, I, I'm quite certain that they will find some way uh, of uh, pushing this over the goal line, but that remains to be seen. So that was a bit about the regulation. So the remaining minutes, I want to say a little bit about activities that we do in order to kind of live up to this regulation. So I'm leading uh, the European networks of research excellence centers uh, in this area. So it's called Taylor. Uh, and we are developing the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI. Uh, by integrating techniques coming from learning, optimization, and reasoning. So the, the overarching vision is really, I mean, how can we develop these scientific foundations for trustworthy AI by integrating uh, methods from these different uh, areas in order to realize the European vision of human-centered, trustworthy AI. And, and I would say that what we really believe in is that there are a lot of potential, a lot of value in both the kind of data-driven machine learning methods that uh, that's the last 10, 15 years have really had a major impact. So that's the kind of representing this fast system when you're looking at human decision making. Uh, but we also have this deliberative, explicit, often logic-based uh, reasoning. Actually, I would argue that if we look at what we do most of our days, it's very much about this analytical thinking, which I would say is very close to, to the more traditional logic-based approaches. And, and both of these have advantages and disadvantages. So by combining them, we believe that we will get a much better system. So that's the overarching theme. Uh, we have also developed a handbook of trustworthy AI. So if you're interested in concepts like fairness and explainability and so on, uh, you can look here and we, we have kind of gathered what is the state of the art there and what are the important concepts. Uh, so one concrete example that uh, my own research group has been working on uh, also in conjunction with Taylor uh, is something called privacy preserving synthetic data generation. So we all know that there is a lot of value in using data, but at the same time, this data might be sensitive. It might be uh, personal information, for example, medical information that we are not allowed to use, we cannot use for various reasons. Uh, but then the general idea is that we take this sensitive data, we can train machine learning models based on this sensitive data, then the machine learning model itself is still sensitive. But then we can sample this model in a structured manner to generate synthetic data from this original data. So we want to generate a synthetic data which is more or less similar or has the same statistical properties at least as the original data but without having the sensitive information and without being able to identify exactly which individual this, this, did this come from. So you basically can generate synthetic patients and so on. Just like we can generate synthetic images of, say, synthetic faces and so on. We do the same in a much more general setting, working with time series data. And what's interesting also is since we're generating this synthetic data, we can then deal with the bias and the fairness. So we can actually change the distributions so that they are, we can, for example, remove the correlation between sensitive attributes and uh, the, the attributes that we're interested in. So we can, we can remove that in the training process. Uh, we can also make it more representative. So if there are... Uh, um, unbalanced groups, if we have very uneven data, then we can rebalance it so we actually get similar amounts of samples from each of the different groups. So this is then research that we have been doing in my group as well. 
Um, yes, I think, well, it's in sake of time. Um, I will not say, but I mean, you know about uh, ChatGPT, and I was just want to say that, well, can you trust ChatGPT? No, you cannot trust it for a number of different reasons, but it's still useful. Uh, so I think even if you cannot trust it, I think it's still useful. And, uh, and, uh, but we have to be critical of the output, and by critically examining the output, we can really take advantage uh, of it. But what I wanted to say is that we recently got a new EU project called Trust LLM funded. So actually, it started formally last week. We will have a kickoff in two weeks, uh, where we will develop uh, uh, open, uh, trustworthy, and more factual large language models. Uh, so we really want to address some of these challenges. Uh, and we will mainly be focusing the Germanic languages because this is a kind of North European uh, consortium. Uh, and we will tackle the full range uh, of challenges when developing this. So basically, how do we collect the data? How do we do the data pre-processing? How do we do the pre-training? How do we do the fine-tuning? How do we do the uh, retriever augmented um, approaches and when serving these models and so on? So basically, looking at the full pipeline. And we also want to build an open ecosystem and engage people outside the consortium in this. And I would say, well, we have collected people that are and have already been building the systems. For example, we have AI Sweden here in Sweden, which have developed the GPT Swedes. We have a Swedish uh, large language model already uh, that they've been working on for some time. We are working with the Germans. We have uh, Fraunhofer and OpenGPTX, and we have TNO in the Netherlands, which just got funding to build the Dutch large language models. And we collect all of these in the same consortium. So we have a lot of practical knowledge in, in doing this. Uh, so we really want, as I already said, we want to cover the full pipeline and we want to make as much of this as open as possible. Of course, exactly how much we can manage to do it will remain to be seen. Uh, and I would say we also focus more on kind of the, the pipeline. I think we will, of course, train real models, whether we will be able to, to how available we can make the actual models remains to be seen. But we definitely want to push the state of art in this area. And there are so many different aspects related to large language models and trustworthiness. So we will not be able to deal with all, but we will deal with reliability, fairness, and certain aspects of explainability and reasoning. Uh, so, so there are much, much more that one can work on in this area. Uh, yes, and to really achieve, really work with this, I think one needs to consider that we, it's all about the combinations of humans and, and, and AI. Uh, we really need to take education seriously. I think we have huge challenges when it comes to competence development, and we need to work in open ecosystems because I don't think anyone will be able to do this on their own. We all need to collaborate. Uh, and of course, we have this ADRA, the AI Data Robotics uh, Association, uh, with this uh, European public-private partnership on AI data and robotics, where the invest uh, commission is investing 1.3 billion euros into this. Uh, and uh, we from the private side is expected to contribute at least as much. Uh, and there we're working on how can we secure Europe's sovereignty over these areas? How can we establish European leadership uh, in these technologies, and how can we build a strong and globally competitive uh, position for Europe in this area? So it's really about how can we make sure that Europe is relevant in these areas. And we just released our strategic research, innovation and deployment agenda. As I said, I presented it uh, yesterday, uh, so I'm, I will not go through it here again, but um, uh, you can find it online. So to conclude, uh, AI is here and now, development is very rapid. AI will have a profound effect on society. I really believe it should be human-centered and trustworthy. Uh, we need to deal with the scale and the speed if we want to stay uh, up-to-date and relevant. Uh, we need to invest in infrastructure and, of course, leadership and competence. And in the end, it's all about AI and humans together. And the ones that are best at doing this will have the best possibility going forward. Thank you. So I think it's now exactly 10 o'clock. So if you have some rush off, some feel free, but otherwise I am happy to take questions. I'm not rushing anywhere. Yes. Yes.
realistically, even if we have these things in place, will we be able to do these things? So the question was related to GDPR and, I mean, experiences from GDPR and related, for example, enforcement. Um, so I think there are very many interesting questions in relation to GDPR as a kind of a reference. Uh, when it comes to enforcement, I mean, there are cases, but I think the major impact is in kind of self-regulation that uh, especially we in the Nordics are really good at self-regulation. Um, so, of course, we take it very seriously. But I think even when it comes to GDPR, I think the, the challenge was that basically you had um, 290 municipalities, 21 regions and 400 government agencies that all interpreted the rules independently. Uh, and you got very different interpretations. So I think that's room for improvement. So if we want to learn something from GDPR, it's better if we do it together, if we can reach some, some con con consensus, then I think we will be much safer and probably implement it much cheaper as well. Um, when it comes to enforcement, I mean, there have been cases, there are cases, I mean, Schrems and so on. Um, so I think it, but that will take time. And I think that's the, the challenge when it comes to this kind of reg or, or legal certainty that that's a concern that um, that it will take a long time until we actually know how to interpret it so sometimes I talk about quantum law I mean it's like a quantum state the law is in many different states we don't know until a judge decides and then we know what the law actually means until then well there are many pos possible interpretations and of course that doesn't make life easier um, and when it comes to enforcement, or actually, I think there are, there are some interesting mechanisms that are intended. For example, there should be competent expert authorities in every country, which you should be able to work with. So it's not only kind of enforcing, but you should be able to have a dialogue with, with the authorities in order to figure out how to do things. And that's very out of, what's that, out of range from normal Swedish way of working with these things, where you, they don't want to discuss. They never give you any, um, I mean, not decisions, but uh, advice. They want to separate the advice from the decision making for, for, I mean, for valid reasons, but that's not going to be the case here. There are also um, aspects related to uh, uh, regulatory sandboxes, that there should be well-established ways of testing the technology and to develop it in, in a bit safer way. Unfortunately, that doesn't work again with Swedish regulation because, I mean, we cannot have, oh, in Malmö, this law doesn't apply. I mean, that doesn't work. All laws apply all the time, everywhere. So, so it's very unclear how they're supposed to work in practice. But at least there are things in, as part of this regulation towards uh, supporting the development. I have seen very little when it comes to enforcement except this kind of uh, uh, national uh, expert uh, authorities. Yes? Mm. So basically, I mean, yeah, regulation and innovation, the relation between them, what's Europe's position there. So, um, I mean, I, I, what I say is that we need to meet regulation with innovation. I'm not against regulation, but I'm, I think if you only regulate without innovating, then we're basically saying, oh, someone else should build the systems that we want. I think it's much better that we build the systems that we want based on our values and our needs, rather than just expecting someone else to do it for us. And actually, I think if you take a kind of economic point of view on this, I think we are in really big troubles, actually, because what's happening now is that every company is basically building their systems using, for example, Microsoft or OpenAI or something like that, which means that all the money that they make on this, they're basically shipping off to the US. So who is making all the profit? Even from the applications we build in Europe, well, still the American economy that's making the major profit. And if we don't want to basically just give away all, all the money to the US, we have to have our own competitive and as good alternatives. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if we just build the kind of application layer, if all the infrastructure and all the uh, kind of um, um, engines behind it is not developed here. So I really think that's an issue. So I always say we need to invest as much in innovation as we invest in regulation. And if we combine it, then we will get the system we want. Yes, I'm back. Yeah. Yes. 
So the question was, what's the relation to this regulation and the military and defense industry? And since the EU has no power over military, because that's considered a national uh, question, this regulation does not apply uh, to military uh, applications. But then, I mean, you have to remember that usually a lot of the things that's been used, say, in I mean, military and law enforcement and so on, are developed on the private market. So, I mean, probably they will have to use the systems as well. Uh, but uh, formally, there is no uh, regulation uh, related to that. And actually, we, we have uh, worked together with law enforcement agencies, and there there are even more challenges because they uh, have they have their own regulation relating to law enforcement agencies uh, that are not necessarily compatible with these regulations, which means that again they cannot develop everything there on their own. They are also reliable, uh, have to buy things on the open market, which means that then the systems need to satisfy both this regulation and the regulation that is applicable to law enforcement agencies. So it's actually making things harder, not not easier, even if they do have some some flexibility, I believe. Okay, I see no further questions, so thank you very much and have a nice day.